Since I posted my review of Elite Dangerous, Frontier went ahead and released patch 1.3. It's a massive patch, which made a number of additions and improvements, like two new ships, like the Lake on Diamondback that you can see here from my footage of the beta, a change to the fine and bounty systems, oh and the Galnet newsfeed has received a much needed facelift. And there are also other little things like the addition of automated drones that can pick up ore fragments when you go mining, hopefully making it a little less tedious. But that sort of stuff isn't what's significant enough to warrant an additional video. No, that would be what the update itself is named for. Power play. So, what is this much vaunted power play? I was going to describe it as a new mode, but actually it's basically an additional empire building game within the main game itself where the players build the Empire, and like the main game, it's pretty simple in concept, but there's a hell of a lot to learn. So forgive me if I bodge some of this, but I'll try and give you as accurate a description as I can. Let's start with the basics. In Elite Dangerous, there were two types of factions within the game. At the top, you had the major factions, the Federation, the Empire, and the Alliance of Independent Systems. At the bottom, you had the minor factions, basically the individual star systems, or rather the governments within them that are allied to and make up the major powers, and also encompasses the uh, independent star systems as well. Now, there is a faction in the middle. These are the powers. These are the guys at the centre of power play. They're the people who hold the real power in the Elite Dangerous Universe. They're a diverse bunch of powerful, influential people. Some of them are allied directly with the major powers, some of their own dependent. They include aristocrats, businessmen, even imperial senators and federation politicians. Hell, one of them is the president of the federation itself. There's even a self-declared pirate king. But whatever their allegiance or their walks of life, they all have the same goal. To spread their power, control and influence over as much of human space as possible. But they don't walk into a star system, overthrow the government and install themselves as a dictator or anything like that. It's supposed to be more a case of control through influence, domination of the local economy, that sort of thing, I guess. Anyway, regardless, that's where you come in. The aim of power play is pretty simple. Pledge allegiance to a power, and along with other commanders who are also pledged to that power, carry out certain tasks to bring more territories under their control, and undermine the control of territory held by rival powers. Everything that happens in power play revolves around a seven-day cycle. Any goals that need to be achieved to allow an action to be successfully taken by a power must be done within that seven-day cycle. If all requirements for an action of your preferred power have been met, then the action will take place at the end of that cycle. Uh, kind of like that time you spend in turn-based strategy games getting stuff organised before hitting the turn button. Well, maybe not quite, but it's close enough for an analogy. Taking control of a system is pretty simple. Commanders who have nomination privileges, you'll earn those pretty quick, vote for a system that should be expanded into. After that, there are three stages to bringing a system under control. Preparation, expansion, and fortification. Each of these stages requires the completion of a certain task. The task depending on the power, which we'll get to in a second, until you and the other commanders reach a trigger point. You then move on to the next stage in the next cycle, until eventually it becomes a fully fortified control system. I'll try and keep it brief, but there's a lot to consider when taking planets. Uh, for example, a chief consideration is that your power has a currency known as Command Capital. This allows your power to pay for the stages of expansion into a star system, as well as its upkeep once you have them. In turn, Command Capital is generated by the star systems under their control. Specifically, it's gathered by the control system, the ones that you take, from exploited systems which are star systems within a certain radius of the control system. Now, this is important to consider when nominating systems to become control systems, because some generate more CC than others, while some will only generate a deficit. So you and your fellow commanders do need to employ some strategic thinking, rather than nominating any old system, nominating only systems that are worth the effort, because obviously you don't want to run a deficit. If you do start running a deficit, you run the risk of a system revolting and attempting to throw off their power's control in order of the most expensive systems, and if that happens too often, you risk your power just collapsing entirely. In addition, yet another thing to consider is that supporters of other powers can contest your expansion attempts. And even if you already hold a star system, it can be undermined by opposing powers, and if they're successful doing that, then the system will revolt and you risk losing it, plus the income that comes with it and you can do the exact same thing to rival powers. Yeah, like I said, 
pretty simple stuff, but there's a lot here to consider. Anyway, if you manage to keep up with all that, you might be wondering, what about the powers themselves? Why would I want to bother with the powers in the first place? Well, I suppose you might be into the game's politics and happen to like the sound of certain people and want to push their cause, but if, like me, you aren't really into the game's politics, there are benefits associated with pledging to a power, and each power rewards a different type of gameplay style depending on their ethos. Some are very militaristic, some are more concerned with social matters, some are entirely business focused, while some are a mixture of the lot, and it's this infos that dictates what kind of tasks you'll be doing to take a star system and undermine rival powers, and the kind of rewards that you'll get. Take Hudson for example. He's a very militaristic chap that feels human-controlled space should be dominated by federal might, so most of his tasks tend to be combat orientated, thus you'll be entering a lot of combat zones. On the opposite side of the spectrum you have Edward Mahon of the Alliance, who is entirely trade orientated, so tasks for his faction were more likely drawing trade orientated players. In between the two is Senator Patrius of the Empire. He's an arms dealer with the biggest private fleet in the Empire, so he mixes a little bit of trade with combat orientated tasks. Of course, there are actual rewards for this stuff. As you gain merit points, which you're given for achieving the various expansion and undermining tasks, you'll rise through a number of ranks, each rank bringing with it a new benefit. To start with, you just get some nomination points, allowing you to have a say into which star systems the power expands into, and you get more of those the higher up the ranks you go. Now, as you go up the ranks, the rewards get better, and depend on the power. Hudson, for example, will increase the payout of any bounties that you kill and cash in within space controlled by him, the amount depending on how he's doing compared to the other powers so bounty hunters with a federal leaning will likely be attracted to him. When you reach a certain rank and have been with the power for a certain amount of time, you gain access to unique weapons, which are not available anywhere else. So yeah, there are plenty of reasons to get involved with a power. You're basically doing the same thing for the powers that you do in normal play anyway, but by joining a power, you are at least now doing them for a reason, which I think is quite swell. There are people out there who don't like the lack of structure in Elite Dangerous. And what's more, you're not stuck with a power once you pledge. If you decide you don't like them, you can either leave or just outright defect to another power straight away, though be warned both actions have consequences, though at the moment nothing especially brutal. So there's power play in a nutshell. You know, there are probably more detailed and organised videos out there, but this isn't meant to be an in-depth review or a guide. It's just a quick overview, as an addition to my original review, just in case there's anyone out there who watched that and wants to see if this new mode is worth adding to their considerations. Now, my verdict? Uh, well, I ain't going to pass a final verdict. Like everything else in Elite Dangerous, power play's not being pushed out with the label of completed products slapped on. There's bound to be additions and refinements made to it in the future, and there's a lot of discussion going on on the forums about what direction people would like it to go. But as it is, I think it's a very worthwhile addition to the game. Although it's a bit overwhelming at first, it gives yet more to do in the game, just as Frontier promised they would add. And for those people who like Elite Dangerous, but they miss a sense of structure, I think this addition will go a long way to providing that. Plus on top of that, it's quite cool to get extra rewards for your efforts, and it addresses one of my previous complaints, which was that there's no faces to put to names of any of the personalities of the various players behind the scenes in this game, helping make things feel a lot more believable when you try to imagine that you're in an actual living universe. Right, well I hope this was some help to those of you still on the fence about whether or not to buy the game, and I'll see you in the next vid.